know they're not supposed to be a theme, but I thought we better do something about the Christmas holiday. So I revamped one from about three years ago, and it's the far side of Christmas. Now, you remember, uh, Gary Larson did the far side, and I can tell you from a medical standpoint, there was something very, very wrong about his brain. I like that in a cartoonist. The holiday time is approaching. It happens faster every year. It's time to care and share and swell some seasonal cheer. But the North Pole's in a tizzy. It's the worst scene I could fear. St. Nick's game's been busted. There may not be Christmas this year. At the all-holiday character greeting, they were planning for the next year, and Chris Kringle was the host again, and the leprechauns brought green beer. It's a time for myths and heroes from the calendar year-round to swap notes and chit and chat and meet on common ground. Cupid complained about the price of arrows, Easter Bunny, the cost of eggs. The presidents wanted one more day, and the whining soon got legs. Jack Frost hates global warming. He thinks it's something solar. And the scientists say because of that, the bears have gone bipolar. The May Queen and Sugar Plum Fairies report they're not all gay, and the turkey's always nervous around Thanksgiving Day. The April Fool was sick and tired of being just a joke. The New Year's babe lives on borrowed time, like most all us folk. The groundhog's mighty dreary of the shadowy life he lives, and Sadie Hawkins can't get a date. She wants to know what gives. Great pumpkin shape was out of round. The hatter still was mad. The witches worked on spells to show who was super bad. It seemed to be sign of the times. There was so much wrong, and Santa had to visit seven billion strong. And there are 8,000 languages in the world that he must learn. He'll be tongue-tied for sure, changing script at every turn. The old-fashioned letter to Santa is almost obsolete. He gets an email list or text or maybe just a tweet. He'll see 24 time zones. Quite a trip, don't you think? And Rudolph's GPS in his nose is on the blink. Home to home, seven million, 75 million miles. He'll have to do his best, but he'll, go, he'll get seven extra hours if he goes east to west. In the contract, or the, the elves have formed a union with the Munchkin kids of Oz, and in the contract, lawyers made sure there was no sanity clause. There's, there's a protest in the cities. Uh, we hope it's a peaceful mob. The best gift of all would be those who want to have a job. Some still primp and entertain with flair, just like the Moulin Rouge, but there are others in this world who'd be outdone by Scrooge. Tornadoes, droughts, and floods, volcanoes, and earthquakes. We should gift wrap better weather for fall, for heaven's sakes. We send Santa tons of fruitcake, none light as a feather. He's not a fan, but what to do, you know, they last forever. By late Christmas morning, Santa suits a total loss. With all those dirty, grimy chimneys, he must give his duds a toss. Mary Poppins chimney cleaners could climb those roofs so steep. But the way it stands, Santa's butt and gut becomes the sweep. St. Nick's lost his cheater glasses. He's on the last hole on his belt, and Mrs. C kindly reminds him he's not looking all that svelte. Up north, they took a pole, and St. Nick was always the chosen. But coming up so strong is the cast of that movie, Frozen. St. Nick will be making sleigh tracks from Nepal to Nantucket, He'll prepare for frigid cold with a douse from the ice challenge bucket. Toys have gone high tech. The North Pole needs a brand new plan. They don't need carvers and bakers, just one good IT man. Good neutered dogs need gifts. No need for shopping at the malls. They're not too picky, easy to please. Just give them popcorn balls. Mrs. Claus wasn't optimistic. It's a mighty tough hill to climb. It might take Christmas magic or the Grinch might win this time. 100 million cookies and some milk at every stop. He thinks, why not five-hour energy and some Baileys on the top? The recessions hit the pole. They're using reindeer chips for wood. They don't crank out many BTUs, and the fire don't smell that good. There's a wind chill in the stratosphere. It keeps Santa's face all ruddy. He'd like a fairing for his sleigh. And riding shotgun, one good buddy. 
The chipmunks are disbanding. Alvin's gone out solo on his own. But Simon is the smart one, and Chubby Theodore's home alone. The economy's tanked. The mortgage flipped. Christmas might be slim pickings. Like Oliver Twist, we might have to be content just breeding Dickens. News flash: the reindeers have gone on strike. The timing is simply awful. They want a higher grade of hay and pay, and their streak has been deemed strike has been deemed lawful. Santa has to have a backup. Slaves can't fly themselves, you know. He has to find a holler that has some get up and go. Rocky the flying squirrel might do in a pinch, but they hooked him up to the sleigh. It didn't budge an inch. Maybe witches on their brooms, though they've got no heart or soul. They said they'd be quite happy to deliver chunks of coal. The Air Force could not help him. Too much combat in the sky, and most gave up so long ago teaching pigs to fly. The Grinch's dog has just retired, and penguin birds are not so fleet. Though they travel by the thousands, and some have happy feet. Peter Pan has ADD, the flying nuns in prayer. Buzz Lightyear was willing, but soiled his underwear. E.T. is out of universe, and Dumbo's got a cold. Rocket Man's on the movie set, and Superman's too old. The pterodactyl is extinct, and flying fish can't land. A flock of geese would drop poop bombs, and that we cannot stand. So Santa's riding on his donkey. He is stubborn, short-legged, and slow. So if Santa's late arriving, he's on his ass out in the snow. Eyes in the sky, watching. The sun at night. Sons and daughters of lunar captivity read. Among the fashionable star-studded night, flashing their burning brilliance, the moon by afternoon, brothers and sisters in suffocating solar shackles released. Within the scorching, suspended bubble of conditioning, dogs they be running free. Those cyclopean beings, a continual unwavering vigilance over us all, sliding like the hands of clocks, a Pandorium box of evil potential unrecognized. We're puppets, our gossamer, thin strings of control like forever. The sun and moon switching sides, good and evil, if you may for a day. Down on us an unseen, unbearable weight. Eyes in the sky, watching. Everybody wonders what dogs are dreaming when they sleep. Dog dreams. It's become an evening ritual when the day at last does wane. There is comfort in routine that keeps us somewhat sane. Walk the dog, kick out the cat, fire up the fan, dim the light. Cons on the left, the terrier between, and... I am on the right. The dog will circle as he must. He's not just being sly. He, his rounds are basic instinct. He surely knows not why. Finally, all are settled with prayers and promises to keep as the trio cycles into slumberland, a well-deserved sleep. The first to reach his dreamscape while sighing on a log is the copper and tan Aussie Terrier, our canis lupus dog. He is a rather small dog, but still takes up half the bed. I doubt it's visions of sugar plums dancing in his head. He kicks and whimpers, wags his tail, and then lets out a bark. What could that boy be dreaming, lying balled up in the dark? He's oblivious to his fellow sleepers, naked as a bottom dollar. Well, that's not entirely true. He has his tags and custom collar. But I digress. My mind returns to what that dog is dreaming. He is not a high-tech hound who would be adept at streaming. Could be he thinks he's Toto with the great and powerful wizard, or maybe the hero Balto who braved the Alaskan blizzard. His own barks don't wake him. He's sleeping through the din and believing he's a new age model of good old Rin Tin Tin. Like Lady and the Tramp movie, he thinks he's quite classy, a celebrity of sorts, much like Benji or like Lassie. I reach down to place a pad and try to comfort him, but he is miles away, dreaming he's a wonder dog named Jim. Yet he's disturbing our sleep now. I might take him to the cellar, but I can't wake him up just now. He's channeling old Yeller. I hope in he's nocturnal life he does not whiz or poo, but 
that is not likely. He's living large like that ditzy Scooby-Doo. He reinvents himself in dreams, ears pointed or quite droopy, or is he World One flying ace, Charlie Brown's dog Snoopy? His dreaming is erratic, sinusoidal, never steady. Could be the reincarnation of Fraser Crane's dog Eddie. He dreams with all his senses, kicking, farting, and a sniffing. Last week, one night, he was TV's brainy Brian Griffin. We need Freud to analyze this dog, which could be his salvation, if we can get him back in time from being a Dalmatian. Does he think he's a college mascot, a Saluki or Great Dane, or Bloodhound or Greyhound or Bulldog to liven up the game? I wish he'd take me with me, with him on his frequent nightly tour. His night must be better than my dreamscape du jour. Then he wakes and turns to me, though he's still half asleep. He's traveled half the universe with his secrets he will keep. <laughs>